But let's, uh, let's just pray together as we get into God's Word. Jesus, thank you for today. Thank you for the chance to study your Word together, to be in your presence. I thank you for what you've already done in our hearts during worship, God. And I just pray that you would draw us closer to your heart through uh, what you're going to teach us today. Meet us right where we're at, the way you always do, God. And I thank you that your Word speaks right to our lives and what we're going through, God. So, do what you do through your word, and we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. We're in this third message in the series called Prayers Through the Bible. We're, we've got seven that we're going through, so uh, we're, we're not even halfway through, but hey, we're in a good spot today. Hopefully you've been gleaning a lot the last couple of weeks. But uh, today, we're, we're going to continue growing in our understanding of prayer, and there's so many different facets to prayer. The one thing that I think is awesome about prayer is for whatever circumstances we're going through, guess what? We can always pray. There's always this opportunity that you and I can step into praying. Now, here's the thing. It's actually one of the things I think is very underutilized or that we take for granted because the idea that you and I actually get to talk to God, the creator of this universe, at any moment, and he's ready to engage us and to talk with us back is, is really just should blow our minds. It really should. And yet most of us don't realize the power we have in prayer. And so I want us to really continue to grow in that. On top of that, today we're going to look at another aspect of prayer that uh, we haven't really looked at up to this point that in some ways is kind of perplexing, but in other ways, you know, we need to tap into this more and that's coming together to pray. Not, not just, listen, prayer, the nature of prayer is very personal, I get that, but there is a, a part of prayer that should be very uh, community focused because there's something incredibly shared in prayer that we can tap into. Jesus said it this way, actually, in Matthew 18, 20, for where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. And the one thing that I've come to realize is, is there's something about just a special experience when you're praying together with somebody that you can't have by yourself. You can't have it by yourself. You have to engage with other people to experience this power of God that he has as we come together. And so we're, we're, we're going to continue to grow in that part of today's story. It really is about coming together in prayer, not just praying individually, but more corporate prayer. But we still have to really form this coming together. And, and I want to build off of two of the principles we've been talking about each week. One is this, that prayer is simply a conversation with God. Now, when we talk to God about coming together in a group, it basically just means as a group, we talk to God. I mean, so it still fits into this. And the second is, is that God initiates prayer. We don't initiate God in prayer. God actually initiates us, and we always respond to him to talk back to him in what, what's going on in our lives. And so the specific story we're going to look at today is found in First Chronicle, or Second Chronicles chapter 20, uh, and it's the story of King Jehoshaphat. Now, King Jehoshaphat is actually a very godly king who is bringing God back to the center of the kingdom. Like, he's really doing a, a lot of great reforms to bring uh, the kingdom of Judah back right in, in making God center to everything. And so you would think when you're doing great things for God, things would go smoothly, right? <laughs> no, actually, if you've been around and you're a Christian, you know that's absolutely not true. A little secret is this. If you're doing something great for God, Satan is going to attack you. <laughs> and you're going to really f feel those attacks. In fact, in, if you're not being attacked by Satan, I would venture to say you're probably not doing great things for God because he's going to leave you alone. Uh, but if you're trying to do something great for God, guess what? He's going to attack. And that's what happens to Jehoshaphat. He's trying to do these reforms, bring his kingdom back to God, and guess what? Three armies form an alliance to come together to take out Jehoshaphat and his kingdom. That's what they're doing here. And the big question for us today is, what do you do when you're attacked? When you're attacked personally, what do you do? You didn't even pick the fight, but the fight came to your door. And what do you do when that happens? Maybe this is personal for you, and it will be personal for you, because Satan uh, is doing things like attacking your finances. You know, and every time it just seems like you're hit financially over and over again. Or maybe he's attacking your well-being, and it just seems like over and over again there's an attack on your well-being. Or maybe it's relational. You know, there's always this relational tension that's happening in your life. On top of having those things, 
We live in a cultural battle against God in our society today. I hope you know that. And guess what? His word and his ways are constantly being challenged in our culture today. They're coming left and right at us. And guess what? If you're standing with God, you too are facing those attacks. The only way you're not facing those attacks is if you're kind of blending in with the flow of the rest of the world and you're not standing with God. But if you're standing with God, guess what? Those attacks are at you too. And so we have, in many ways, we find ourselves on on many different levels facing these attacks because of our walk with God. And so uh, today, I believe God's word has something to teach us about how we stand and we fight in, in these battles, and we see the victory of God brought forth in our lives. And so we're just going to jump into today. Um, and so here's, here's the scene in First Chronicles chapter 20. An army made up of three countries is coming after them, and by the time King Jehoshaphat finds out, they're 25 miles away. Okay, so not very far, maybe takes a, uh, two days, let's say, to get there when you're moving a whole army uh, or three armies, really. Uh, so what is the first thing you do if you hear that there's some armies coming to attack you? I mean, probably most of us would think about, if you're the king, maybe call up your generals and come up with a plan to counterattack or maybe surprise attack them, right? You might start evacuating the women and children so that, you know, they're not in harm's way when the attacks come their way. Uh, you might hide, <laughs> maybe, right? I'm going to hide. We're just going to shut down the city and pretend we're not here. Like, that, that would be some things that you would think about. But Jehoshaphat does none of these things. Take a look at what he does. Look at verse 3 through 4. And Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord and proclaim the fast throughout all Judah. And Judah gathered themselves together to ask help of the Lord, even of, out of all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. So first of all, let me point out, Jehoshaphat is filled with fear, okay? By the way, fear is not a sin, Okay, fear is a natural response that every one of us has when certain circumstances come bearing down on us as out of our control. Uh, fear can become sin. It's what we do with fear that, that really makes it a sin. Okay, but fear itself is a natural God-given response that he has given us so that we're not stupid. Because <laughs> if you're not afraid, guess what? You're going to do stupid things. And so God gives us this nature of fear. Now listen, Jehoshaphat, what he does with his fear is he takes the fears he experiences, and he turns it to God. He turns his attention to God, okay? That's what he's doing here, which is what you and I should do and allow fear to do in our lives, to drive us to the foot of Jesus, okay? And if we are honest, though, too often, what do we allow fear to do? Turn us away from God, right? So fear comes in, and we start, we start trying to like hide, do things on our own. We don't turn to God. We, we turn away from God, and many times that happens. But Josh, Jehoshaphat leads the way, and he leads the way to seeking God, and call it, he calls a fast, and he calls all of Judah together to come together to seek God. And the, when, when people respond this way, when people respond to attacks this way by going to God first, it's not like just something that they decided to do once at this moment. There's some planning that goes, there's some shaping in their lives that has prepared them for this moment that they would actually turn to God when they're being attacked. Jehoshaphat, remember what he's been doing. He's been leading his country to seek God, right? He's, he's been leading these reforms. So it, it makes sense that if, hey, this whole time I've been pointing our country to seek the Lord, right? So when an attack is coming, it just kind of flows back into that where we're going to seek the Lord. But on top of that, what you need to know about his background is this. I, I told you that in the, in the country of Judah or the, uh, the, the, the land of Judah, which is where he's king over, uh, the, the two nations have been split in half. There's, uh, there's the Israel and then there's Judah. So this is just the Judah tribes. And he's over this. They're godly kings and there are evil kings. So there are a little bit of both mixed in here. But listen, it's interesting because we know already Jehoshaphat's one of those godly kings. But guess what? His father also was a godly king. And his name was Asa. And it just so happened that Asa uh, really probably 
experienced something that Jehoshaphat never forgot as he saw his father deal with leading his country. Because while Jehoshaphat, or while Asa was over the country, he too was leading reforms. He was getting rid of idols that had become prevalent in Judah. And he had been getting rid of those and turning people's hearts back to God. And really, Jehoshaphat comes in and continues those reforms that his father was doing. But while his father was doing these things, guess what? An army comes against him as well. It's the Ethiopian army, and there's like a million foot soldiers and another 300 chariots coming their way, and they're way outnumbered and have no chance to really beat this Ethiopian army. And so this is what his father Asa did. Look at Second Chronicles 14. So you go back six chapters, and it says this, And Asa cried unto the Lord his God and said, Lord, it is nothing with thee to help, whether with many or with them that have no power. Help us, O Lord, our God, for we rest on thee, and in thy name we go against this multitude, O Lord, thou art our God. Let no man prevail against thee. And so look at what he did. He turned to prayer. His father turned to prayer. God answered that prayer too by something miraculous. He struck the Ethiopian army so that they took off and fled from Judah. They didn't even have to go out. They, they, just, they pursued them and kept chopping them down, but God started the victory, and it was a great victory for God and for his people. And so think about this. Jehoshaphat, he grows up with this story. I mean, you don't, you don't grow up in a household and dad not tell that story over and over and over to you again about the time that, you know, this army was coming against you, you're way outnumbered, and God showed up. And so over and over, he's heard down this, he's heard this story. What, what is... Asa doing? He's passing on a heritage of faith to his son Jehoshaphat. And, he, and really, that heritage set him up for this battle that he's facing. I just want to encourage you, parents, to understand that the battles you fight and the victories that God brings to your life are meant to be passed down to your kids. They're meant to hear and see those things because those things just maybe are preparing them for a future battle they're going to face in their own lives. Asa turns to God and when he has this impossible battle comes in front of him. And so it's natural when Jehoshaphat has this battle that's coming towards him that is impossible for him to fight, that he would follow after what his dad does and seek God in prayer. So please understand this. If you're not turning to the Lord now before the battle comes your way, when the battle comes, you're not going to turn to the Lord. It's just not going to happen. That's not going to be what your instinct is, is going to be. And so the problem with that is, is turning to the Lord is the key to victory. And we're going to see that in the story, that there's a really important thing about turning to God and how we turn to God. So Jehoshaphat has them all assembled. He has them come together. He leads them in prayer. And I want us to walk through some of the prayers that he prays. Now remember this. Remember, prayer is conversation. And so I want you to look at this because, listen, sometimes we don't look at prayers as talking with God. We look at them as only talking to God, right? There's a big difference between talking to God and talking with God. That's why it's a conversation. We talk with God. And some of us, the only prayer we know is talking to God. <laughs> that you're missing out on what prayer really is. And so I want you to see that as we look through this, okay? It's an invitation to walk with God. The second thing is what? They're praying, right? Because why? A battle's coming their way. God allowed this battle to come into their lives so that they would turn to God and talk about it. God has allowed yours and my problems to come into our lives so that we would talk to God about it. That's why he's the one initiating these conversations. He lets them come into our lives, and, and there's an invitation now for us. What are we going to do with this problem? Are we going to handle it on our own, or are we going to turn to God and we're going to talk about it? And Jehoshaphat turns to God, and he talks about it. So we'll pick up in verse 6 through 7, and he, he begins leading the congregation, saying, O oh Lord God of our fathers, are you not... God in heaven, and do you not rule over all the kingdoms and nations in, in your hand? Is there not power and might so that no one is able to withstand you? Are you not our God who drove out these, the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and gave it to the descendants of Abraham, your friend forever? Now listen, if you look at that very closely, he's asking questions, right? These are questions he's asking God. And really, some of these questions, are, they make sense, right? Like, here he is coming after, this army's coming after him, and, and really he begins with some questions that, that really come up based out of this. They're based on something they already believe about God. 
Okay, they're not questioning God. They're really based on stuff they already believe about God. And so they're not really going, hey, God, I don't know if this is who you are, really. They're not really questioning God as much as they're questioning how what they're facing circumstantially lines up with the fact that God is this. This is our God. Let, let me just try to simplify that for you, okay? Because think about this. Over the years, I'm sure, if you look over the last 10 years, there's many different people who could look at what's going on in our country and, and go, is God in control? right? Is God really in control if this is happening in our nation? And really, most of you, I would probably venture to say, know that God is in control. And so when you question, is God in control, that question is really because the circumstances have really blurred the lines because you can't understand how God is in control and this is still going on. You're not really questioning if God is in control. You're just questioning, I don't get it because I didn't think this could happen if God was in control. <laughs> That's what basically Israel is doing here, or Judah is doing here, Jehoshaphat, in asking and questioning God. He just, he can't understand how this army's attacking when they've been faithful to God. It, it, they were supposed to be protected. And so he goes on to pray this in verse 8 and 9, and they dwell in it and have built your sanctuary in it for your name, saying, if disaster comes upon us towards uh, a sword of judgment, pestilence, or famine, we will stand before this temple and in your presence, for your name is in this temple, and cry out to you in our affliction, and you will hear and save us. What we see what Jehoshaphat is doing is he's coming to God based upon God's covenant with him and the promises he's made. He, he's actually quoting basically Solomon and when he dedicated the temple and when they would be attacked, they could turn towards God in this temple and he would save them and rescue them. And the reason I think it's important for you and I to approach God based on the covenant he has made with us is because we often fail in our faithfulness to God, right? God has been faithful to us, but I'm not always faithful to God. And so what do I appeal to when I'm not faithful? I have to appeal to our covenant that God has remained faithful to me. And unfaithfulness may be the reason why a battle is coming our way, but the answer to overcoming that battle, to experience the victory we need, is to stand before God's presence and cry out, God, we, we need you to save us. That's what it is. That's what Jehoshaphat's leading the congregation in. And, and so he's talking to God and he reminds God that these three countries that are coming at him are, it's really interesting if you look at the three countries that are coming after him, they were countries that God said, leave them alone. Go through the promise, go to the promised land, but leave these nations alone. And, and Jehoshaphat's saying, you know, God, we've been, we've been obedient to you. We haven't touched them. And now they're unjustly coming after us. We've obeyed you, God, though. And so what are you going to do about it? And so he goes on to say this in verse 12, Our God, oh our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power against this great multitude that is coming against us, nor do we know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. He's asking God to intervene based on what? On justice, right? He's not demanding, but he's asking God, God, would you intervene in this situation? Would you intervene here? Because guess what? We don't have the power to defeat them. We know that. And it, actually, we're standing here and we have no idea what to even do. <laughs> and those are two critical things. Have you ever been there? You know what you're going through is not fair. This isn't just. And yet you don't have the power to change it on your own. And so you don't have, you just throw your arms up. I don't have the power to change this, God. But don't miss something important here. He never tells God what he's to do in the situation. This is how many of us pray, right? God, Figured it out. I got this problem going on, and this is what I need you to do. Do it. Right? That's how we pray. Jehoshaphat doesn't do that. He says, God, this isn't right, and I'm appealing to you to fix this problem. Right? But you can do it however you want. You're God, and I'm not. Right? So listen, we come to God with our problems. We ask him, but we don't, we don't tell him the solution. We let him come up with the solution to our problems. Because listen, what you do, is, it, what we have to be careful is, is we don't try to control God because we can't control our circumstances. That's what many of us do. Can't control our circumstances, so I try to control God and tell God what he needs to do. And, and really, we can't do that because if he doesn't intervene and do it his way, then we're going to lose. So let God be God. Be like Jehoshaphat. When you're at that breaking point, make sure your declaration is this. No matter what, no matter what, my eyes are going to be on you, Jesus. 
My eyes are on the Lord. That is so critical because really it's so much easier in the battle to, to what? Turn your eyes from the Lord to the battle you're facing, right? And not keep them on the, on the Lord. But our victory lies only in the Lord, not the battle. It's only going to be in, in Him that we find that victory. Now, again, it's honestly easy to say, my eyes are on the Lord, right? That's easy to say. But it's really hard to keep them there. <laughs> and that's our issue. Most of us don't keep them there long enough to get the answer to what we really need God to do in our lives. And so look at what the next thing says in, in verse 13. Now all Judah with their little ones, their wives and their children stood before the Lord. Remember last week I said sometimes prayer is what? Standing before the Lord. This is another one of those instances. We just stand before the Lord. When we don't know what to do, stand before the Lord. And here you have all of Judah. It's not just Judah. It's not just the guys. It's the wives. It's the little ones. It's the children. They're all standing in the presence of the Lord just waiting for God to do something. We have no indication of how long they waited. They're just waiting. I mean, we read that quickly because it goes to the next verse and it tells us that God spoke. But God didn't necessarily speak right away in that moment, in that instant. And so here's what I know. I know that there's been times in our church where we've had these moments that are holy moments where we just know God is breaking in and there's just this call to silence. And I'll tell you what, for about 30 seconds, most of us are good. And then there's a tension that starts building in the room, right? <laughs> And that tension builds in the room and makes us very uncomfortable. And if we would allow that, most of us wouldn't make it five minutes waiting for God to speak to us. What do we do? We'd be like, oh, well, I gave you a chance, God. I'm out of here. You took so long, right? And so there, there have been times where I know God's moving, but, but, but we don't wait long enough because we get too uncomfortable. This, this, when it happens corporately, what I know is this that it also happens personally. That if we can't wait corporately in the presence of the Lord, we're not waiting personally in the presence of the Lord, giving him plenty of time to talk to us. And so we're struggling to wait on God in private. Yet what would happen if they waited a minute and said, God, we're out of here? They, wouldn't have, they would have left and not heard the Lord, right? They would have missed God. Here is what's critical. It's not that God didn't have something to say because he certainly did, it's that we weren't willing to wait long enough keeping our eyes on the Lord. We just weren't. There's a huge act of faith in waiting on the Lord that many of us don't realize that we need to tap into. Waiting on the Lord is not inactivity. It's, it takes a lot of hard work to stand in the presence of the Lord waiting. And in some ways, it's one of the hardest things we do. But if you want the victory that God has for your life over the battle you're facing, then the only thing you can do is stand and wait on the Lord. Because your plans, you already know, they're not going to work, right? You're in this situation because I have nowhere else. My, my plans, this, this battle's too big for me, God. So you can't even fix out this problem yourself. So you already know that. So what do you need? You need a word from the Lord. Only a word from the Lord is going to fix the situation you're in. And so you might think, I don't have time for that. Let me give you two things from the story that, that really addresses that. First in the story, an army is marching towards them, remember? <laughs> They're going to be there in just a few short hours. So you could say they didn't have time either, right? But you, when you realize your only solution is God, then waiting on him is the only thing that actually makes sense. Here's what your and my problem is. We don't have time to wait on God because we have plan B, C, and D over here that if God takes too long, well, I'm just going to revert to this, right? And so God isn't the only thing we're holding on to, waiting because we're desperate to hear word from him, and yet he is the only thing that, again, will bring us that victory. And the second thing is that what, what, what were they called to? They were called to a fast. What is fasting about? The, the reason why we call a fast, the reason why we come to the Lord fasting is we're saying, God, I give you all of my attention. I'm not going to let anything distract me from hearing from you, from being in your presence. So in other words, they're standing there as long as it takes. We don't even have to take food breaks, God. <laughs> we don't even have to go to lunch. No, I'm going to wait until we have a word from the Lord. And they waited. And as they waited, guess what? The Spirit of the Lord comes on a man named Jehaziel. 
And God speaks his word through this guy, and he says this in verse 15 through 17. Thus says the Lord to you, do not be afraid nor dismayed because of this great multitude, for the battle's not yours, but God's. Tomorrow go down against them, and they will surely come up by the ascent of Ziz, and you will find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness of Jeruel. You will not need to fight in this battle. Position yourself, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord who is with you, O Judah and Jerusalem. Do not fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord is with you. And really, as they wait on the Lord, they get this word from God that is filled with incredible encouragement that addresses their very fears, right? By telling them, hey, you don't have to carry those fears anymore. Why? Because God says the battle's not yours, it's mine. Okay? And some of you need this incredible truth in your very own lives today because the battle you are facing is not yours, but it is the Lord's. And so the reason you can't see the victory is because you're trying to fight the battles. And if you would stop fighting and you would step back, you would see God move. Because it's not our battles, it's his anyways. Now God didn't say to them that since the battle's mine, go home and take a break and just get back to life as normal, right? He didn't say do that. He said something very important. He says, go in and and take a position against the enemy still, but you're going to watch me work now. Why does he do that? Listen, so often, this is where you and I fail. We go home. God says, I got the battle, we go home. But we don't take our positions and stand and watch what the Lord's going to do. And because we don't see our enemies defeated, guess what often happens to you and I? Something comes back in the back of our mind where we we live in fear still about our enemies maybe popping back up, right? We think things like, maybe it's just quiet right now, but guess what? Soon enough, that enemy's going to pop right back up, right? Or or maybe, you know, the victory's temporary. It's only temporary, right? That's that's what the enemy wants to say in your ear. And in the back of our minds, there's this fear over and over and over again that the enemy is going to rise again. And the reason why that fear is there is because we didn't see God win the victory. If you were to stand against the enemy, you will see what God does to them. And guess what? You will know beyond a shadow of a doubt that they're not going to come back for any more whoopings from God. Like God destroyed them and utterly obliterates them. And you have no fear of this enemy in front of you any longer when you see and stand and see God bring that victory to you. And there's one more thing that we need to do is, is we need to hear what God is going to do through this. He says, stand here and, and look what they did. There's one more thing that they did. They worshiped. Look at verse 18 through 19. It says, And Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground, and all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem bowed before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. And then the Levites of the children of the Kohathites and the children of the Korathites stood up to praise the Lord God of Israel with voices loud and high. This is worship, not because they experienced the victory yet. This is worship based on the promise of a victory that's coming. They haven't experienced it yet. But listen, they knew God spoke to them and they were so overwhelmed with what he was about to do that the only response is worship. The same needs to be true with us. When God gives you a word and shows you what he's going to do, the response of you and I should be, God, I'm just going to worship you. I'm going to worship you even before it happens. So they worship God, and then they go to bed. And look what happens in the next day, verse 20. So they rose early in the morning and went out into the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, and you shall be established. Believe his prophets, and you shall prosper. I think there's great significance in this passage, actually that Jehoshaphat got up very early the next day and he left. And I think there's two reasons why that I want to point out. The first is when you get a clear direction from the Lord, you have to obey right away. Listen, true obedience has to act. You can't put it off. The second thing is waiting around opens the door to doubt. The longer you wait, the more doubt is going to creep in. Many of you know exactly what I'm talking about. Because on Sunday... God speaks to you very clearly and says, hey, you have the victory over this. And he tells you why. And he gives you all the verses and all of the encouragement and go, I can, I, I, you, you walk out of here, what? 
walking on cloud nine going, yes, God, you've got the victory in this. But then you go to bed, right? And you wake up on Monday morning with all kinds of doubts, right? This is why the best thing we can do is when we clearly have heard from God is act. Act in obedience right away. Get, get to it. Don't wait. And so they got up early and they move out, but that leads to another critical question. If the battle's not yours and it's God's, what do you do in the battle? And the answer again is worship. It may not seem like the best battle plan because think about this. You're worshiping God. You're not sneaking up on your enemies. They know exactly where you're at, right? (laughs) You have a whole mountain of people worshiping God. They know exactly their positions. And so what is it? What is it? Is it an act of faith? They're going to worship God out of an act of faith because they actually believe that God is going to fight the battle for them. He's going to do what he said he's going to do. And he's going to bring this promise. They know the battle is the Lord's. And so we're going to put action to our faith in God. We're going to show him we believe that what he says is true. And so in verse 21, it says, And when they had consulted with the people, he appointed those who should sing to the Lord and who should praise the beauty of his holiness. And they went out before the army and were saying, Praise the Lord for his mercy endures forever. I want you to think about how worship can be an act of faith. Uh, in our lives. What are you doing when you worship? You literally are, you're praising and exalting God. You're, you're placing all of your focus and all of your attention, you're putting your eyes on the Lord, right? That's what worship is doing. The thing about worship is, is that you can be around it and it means nothing. Unfortunately, I can see this every once in a while on a Sunday morning, right? And you can see those, uh, there's this great meaning in worship and people are engaging and then there's some other people that it just means nothing and there's no emotions, nothing connection, no connections making during worship. But yet when you worship and it means everything, what, what you know is happening in our hearts and our lives, if you've experienced this, is what? God is getting bigger and my circumstances are getting smaller. Every time in worship, that's what you find out. And, but at the same time, the cool thing about worship is it can be con- contagious. Because every one of us has walked in and just had a tough week, right? And you don't want to worship, but guess what? You get around other people that are worshiping, and you know the joy that they're experiencing you need, and so you just start entering in, and the next thing you know, guess what? You have joy. And there's something powerful about worship. But we also get a glimpse from the story that there is one more awesome thing that happens when we worship. Look at verse 22. It says, Now when they began to sing and to praise, the Lord set ambushes against the people of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, who had come against Judah, and they were defeated. You see what happened? When they began to sing and praise God, God began to move. I don't know how it works, but I know it does that when we praise, power of God is released. When we praise and worship God, his power is released in our midst. And I've seen it in my life. I've seen it in the lives of others. And I also see it over and over in Scripture. Let me give you another example, a story in the New Testament that points out how the power of God is released in praise. You might remember two small guys named Paul and Silas got arrested for, for preaching Jesus beaten, put in stocks, in prison, couldn't sleep. So what are they doing? At midnight, they're worshiping God and they're praising God. What, what do we see happen? In the middle of their praising, all of a sudden, God just rocks the whole earth. The earthquake happens, their chains fall off, their prison doors spring open wide, and it all was a result of what? Praise. You might be here and feel in a prison, feel chained, And I'm going to tell you that one of your keys to victory is praise. As you praise, those prison doors are going to fling open and those chains are going to fall off and you're going to experience the power of God in your life because you worship God. I believe that worship is such an act of faith that when we, we have to step out because we come up to immense obstacles. We come up to our enemies. But when we go to praising God anyways, that's the moment when he is moved to respond. And he just does. He's moved to respond as we praise. So as we close today, I want us to see the end of the story. Jehoshaphat 
and his worshiping army are standing there watching these three armies literally kill each other. <laughs> That's what happened. They literally start killing each other, and they were literally defeated without Judah having to fight them at all, right before their eyes. And because they all killed each other, they, they ended up leaving behind all of their stuff, <laughs> All of their jewels, all of their gold, all of their clothes, all of their stuff. And it takes three days for the Israelite army to gather up all their stuff. That's how much stuff they had. Listen closely. Their biggest trial became the source of their greatest blessing. Because they were willing to what? Go to the Lord first. They were willing to wait until he spoke and told them what to do. And then they were willing to obey. What they thought would destroy them ended up blessing them. And God can do that. And he wants to do that over and over and over in our lives. And so on the fourth day, after they gather all this together, it's only proper that they come back together and do this. Look at verse 26 through 28. And on the fourth day, they assembled in the valley of Berica, where for there they blessed the Lord. Therefore, the name of that place is called the valley of Berica to, until this day, and then they returned every man to Judah and Jerusalem with Jehoshaphat in front of them to go back to Jerusalem with joy, for the Lord had made them rejoice over their enemies. And so they came to Jerusalem with stringed instruments and harps and trumpets to the house of the Lord. What did they do again? They worshiped. They worshiped. And so what we find is that they worshiped God before the battle, during the battle, and after the battle. In other words, worship was their lifestyle. It wasn't just something they did from time to time. It encompassed everything they were and did. And I realize that this message is supposed to be about prayer, but I will tell you this, that when we pray, worship becomes a huge part of our prayer lives. You cannot pray without worship entering in and becoming a huge part of, of your heart because guess what? As God shows you what he's going to do and he grabs your heart towards the very things that he is doing in your life, the only response to that is to worship and praise him. And it needs to be expressed as we talk to God. And so worship is a natural response. That's why the psalmist says this in Psalm 103.1, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his name. Bless his name. That is something that every single one of us needs to, to really declare in our own lives. I'm going to bless the Lord, O my soul, all that is within me, I'm going to bless his name. And as we do that, as we worship God, we see the enemy pushed back and defeated. And the victory becomes ours in the Lord Jesus. And it's very powerful. We're going to go to prayer and we're going to close with a song. Um, but let me just close in prayer. And then we're going to go into a time of just worship again. And then communion. So if you didn't grab communion, maybe grab it in the back. Let me pray. And then if you would just stand up as we worship God with a song today. Jesus, thank you for your word. I thank you for the victory that is ours in you, Jesus. And that, God, you have made a way through. And so many times, God, it's there. But we have not waited to hear a word from you, to know clearly the direction you have for us to go in whatever battle we're facing in life. Yes, and I pray, Lord Jesus, that we would be willing to step into that uncomfortable silence yes. I'm just standing before the Lord in your presence and waiting for you to move, God. So I pray, Lord Jesus, today, because I know many of us are here today, we're facing so many different battles, God, in our lives personally. And we haven't seen victory, but God, may we find victory in you, Jesus. May we know, God, that, Lord, we can trust you, we can stand, and we can watch you fight the battle, God. And so I pray, Lord, you would just minister to our hearts and our lives in a powerful way and bring us to those very things that you're, you're wanting us to stand and face, Lord. I thank you that the victory is yours, God, and that the battle is yours. And I just pray that throughout this room, as we worship you, God, today, that we would see and experience victory in our lives, God, as you set ambushes against the enemies in our lives. And we praise you for that in Jesus' name.